everyone. I'm Julia Colbert. I'm the program manager for Project Cities. Thank you for coming today to the Project Cities and City of Peoria showcase for the spring 2023 semester. I have here with us today some special guests from the city. Uh, Jay Davies, the public works director Victoria and Victoria Castor and Sawyer Trees here from the Water Services Department. So you all know Victoria and Sawyer because you've been working with them this semester, um, but Jay is, has come today as well to lend his ear and expertise to all the great things you worked on this semester. Uh, we also have Ann Richmond here, who's the director of the Sustainable Cities Network, as well as Project Cities. So thank you to our guests today. Um, and otherwise, uh, I will keep my intro comments short for the presentation and hand it over to uh, Dr. Mike Chester to introduce the class and the projects briefly before we go into the students. So thanks, guys. Appreciate you coming over here. Um, Quick points of safety. So uh, fire exit, you go out that door right there, take a left out the back stairwell if we need it. Um, bathrooms, go out that door, take a right, they're on the left. So um, we've got 75 minutes. So I wanna hand it over to the class as soon as possible. Um, you've got four teams in the class. Three of the four teams are focused on sustainability and resilience within the sustainability plan. I know some of you know this already. One of the teams is focused on building codes. So there's actually two presentations. We'll share everything with you guys afterwards. I think the building codes team actually has building codes, 25 pages that they're gonna hand over to you so that they don't have to show it in the PowerPoint. So you guys can take that home. We also have a PDF, but we'll give you all the digital everything. Um, where we're at, the class has about um, a week, May 3rd is the, the actual date to finish, finish. So final reports will be coming in. But what you're seeing now is basically it in terms of the thinking on the topics. Uh, the report will flush out all the details. Um, the four teams uh, each have about four or five students, sometimes three, but I've asked that only one or two present. So everybody else has absolutely supported them uh, along the way. We have everybody but one student here who's very sick and didn't wanna get us sick. So Thomas is online. Thomas does wanna speak. And uh, Thomas who can presumably hear us right now, Oh, Thomas is not gonna speak. Okay, so that's fine. So Shaylin's gonna cover for Thomas, I presume. Yeah, but Thomas is in the background there uh, just in case. So um, we're gonna go in order. The sustainability plan uh, uh, teams, A1, A2, A3 will go first. They're in one presentation and then we'll kick it over to uh, the building code team. Each team is about 15 minutes. That's the goal, right guys? And um, then we'll open it up to you guys for Q&A. So I'm gonna suggest that we just hold all the questions for the very end. We have the room until 4.15, which is uh, 72 minutes from now, okay? All right, guys. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Madison. She'll kick us off. Yeah, let me double check that it's being recorded. Recording. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Madison. I'm from Group A1, along with Abby, Sarah, and Peyton. And we were tasked with evaluating visual methods to communicate the sustainability pillars, goals, and accomplishments. So just as a background, there are eight pillars. We were told to find one indicator in each pillar that would be best for a visual figure. And we went about figuring out how to do this by conducting a literature review of general data visualization best practices, uh, sustainability indicator best practices, and then best practices for community engagement using visual techniques. And then from that, we sort of chose which indicator was most relevant to present from each pillar. And then we developed some visuals, which I'll show towards the end. So breaking that down into four distinct research questions, the first question was which goal best represents the progress made in each pillar, uh, then which goal is most appealing and relevant to the public, as you'll see in the literature review, that's really important for visual communication. Uh, next, we looked at what specific visualization techniques would be best for engaging and educating the public. And then finally, we did a little bit of analysis on if the indicators that Peoria is currently measuring communicate progress towards the pillars of the sustainability plan. So first talking about our literature review in general best practices for scientific communication. 
it's really important, especially when you're communicating very complex concepts like sustainability, to break your message down into a story that people can follow. Uh, it's also important to use simple language. Um, thinking about the knowledge, the current knowledge of your public is also very important so that you're playing to that and that you're also sort of playing to the interests of your audience. Uh, accessibility is really key, of course, uh, regarding the font, color, uh, colorblind friendly palettes. And then after you've created visuals, it's always good to test them with an audience, sort of see what takeaways they're getting from the video or from the visuals, and then compare that towards what you originally wanted them to take away from the visuals. Just see if everything is matching up. And then finally, depending on that test, you can sort of see, okay, maybe this visual was sending a different message. What would happen if I added a clarifying detail in the form of a caption or otherwise edited the visual? So talking about sustainability indicators specifically and their communication, like I said, sustainability is a really complex concept. Uh, as such, different people will have different interpretations of it. So just saying the word sustainability is very loaded and different. it will bring different things to mind for different people. So indicators help you concisely communicate the information on what you mean by sustainability and how you're measuring it. Um, urban sustainability in indicators in particular are focused on portraying understandable and relatable information. Uh, they help with progress tracking over time and they sort of bridge policy making, strategic planning, science, learning, values, all of these things into one and then display it in a quick, easy to disseminate way. Uh, finally, indicators are important to getting engagement through the community. So if you're connecting to the community's values, they might see, oh, look, Fiori is doing this for sustainability. How can I help out? So it's really important to be very intentional with how you're portraying the information because it could have a much bigger role in community engagement, not just in disseminating the information. So again, community engagement being key, it's important to understand that engagement is a process. It depends both on the usability of the data that you're presenting. So is that data understandable to the community? Is that something that they can relate to or even conceptualize? And is the data credible? So are they trusting the way that you've taken the data and the fact that that data is supposed to represent whatever sustainability pillar it has been chosen to represent? Additionally, it's important to use citizen data, input and feedback. Um, again, the importance of thinking about your audience's values and ideals is key. And then finally, good engagement promotes civic action. So here we just have a couple of examples from Seattle. Uh, they displayed some sustainability indicators with the goal of engaging citizens. And you can see that they're using big numbers and they're also localizing the image. So if you were to live in one of these neighborhoods or know where this intersection is, you sort of, you get a picture in your mind and you kind of have a picture on the right hand figure of what you're thinking about. And you can sort of start to visualize as a community member, oh, this is where this is happening. Maybe let me go help out with that. So additionally, we looked at different cities in the Valley area and compared them to Peoria's sustainability pillars and their current communication of it. So as we know, Peoria has eight pillars. They're presented in a report form with embedded visuals. The city of Phoenix has several has seven comparable goals, uh, and they're presented through a website with clickable links that bring you to infographics like the one displayed here. And then finally, the city of Scottsdale has over 20 elements in their sustainability plan, also presented as clickable links on a website. And the visuals are very targeted for stakeholders. You can sort of see the difference in visual techniques here from Peoria's current plan on the left uh, being kind of specific, but also more visual, not necessarily portraying data where the middle figure is an infographic that 
really clearly indicates what you're trying to get across with water supply. And then further to the right, it's more specific. And this information would make sense to a specific group to, of stakeholders, which would be important depending on who you're trying to communicate to. So getting into the actual indicators in our assignment, we are listing each indicator that we chose for each of the pillars here. So for building and energy, we chose to display the energy savings, which we don't actually have the data for yet, but we sort of presented it in a format where you could go in and edit it as you get that data. Uh, we chose this because it would help people understand what the savings, energy savings would be from an energy project like that. For or urban form, we chose to present the total acres of preserved open space in the cities which is appealing to citizens' enjoyment of parks, natural areas, open spaces. Uh, for transportation, we made a figure about public transit routes and stops. We saw this was a high priority metric for Peoria, and we think that it could help increase awareness of where the routes are, where the stops are, and maybe even encourage public transit use, which is in line with sustainability. And then finally, the community health and wellness pillar, we chose the housing resources provided to residents because this is offered to all homes and it's another resource that might be good to advertise, to incentivize use of it. Moving on to the natural spaces and community forestry pillar, we looked at the number of city spaces converting into natural spaces and displayed that. Um, again, this is sort of also an advertising piece where you can say, oh, look at these new areas that we've turned into parks. Uh, solid waste management, we looked at the waste diversion rate, and we chose this one because there's a specific goal associated with it. So you can sort of think about over time, where is your progress? And people can see like, oh, we're almost at the goal of 22%. We're currently at 19%. Uh, for water resources, we chose water savings from residential rebates because putting gallons of water on display sort of helps citizens think about, oh, like, I don't know, personal water use. It's something they can connect to. And then finally, sustainability engagement and education. We chose the number of sustainability U attendees. And we chose that because the number of program attendees more connects to citizens who could make an active choice to attend the program, as opposed to another metric, which was click rate, which we don't usually think about the rate that we're clicking things as citizens. So here are four of the visuals. They are grouped together because these four are in one style and the next four are in sort of a different style. This style is more cartoony. Um, we do have a real map though, showing the routes specifically, but yeah, the key with these is that we're visualizing a number and then we're sort of associating a simple picture with them. Whereas another route you could take depending on stylistic choices, this sort of looks more like what the current sustainability plan is, where you have text and figures overlaid on top of big visuals. Uh, this is another way to either just convey numbers or even you can see with the landfill waste, we have both the goals overlaid and this image in the background. So throughout all the visuals, we Specifically, we're focusing on how to elicit emotion. Um, how are we connecting the community objectives to what Peoria's objectives are with sustainability? Color was really important and one of our considerations because color can help elicit certain emotions and moods. Of course, textile size and arrangement can help establish tone. The layout helps with how you're moving through the figure visually. Uh, we chose to overlay maps because that helps give some spatial context for certain data. And then finally, we use a lot of images and illustration to convey more complex messages. So in terms of discussion, there are a couple of points that might be good to think about when moving forward with future collection of indicator data. Uh, we found that the lack of spatial and temporal data made it difficult to visualize change over time. Um, that's sometimes really important in communicating sustainability progress because you can sort of say, oh, we were here at this point and here's where we've gotten to. And that's something I imagine you will be able to do in future years as you have this data, but currently it's not incorporated into the figures and it would be great to incorporate them at a later date. 
Second, um, it's very important to have simplicity in the way data is communicated. So having the tables in the figure either just have less words or just say something a little bit more visually appealing or even converting the report format into a more interactive format like we saw with the city of Scottsdale uh, where you can sort of click on different things as you're interested in them. And that way you could also track which pillar are they more interested in. Um, and then finally, revising indicators. We have more specific suggestions for this in our report, but we felt like there were some places where different data could also be collected to speak directly to improve sustainability. Uh, with transportation, not only could you look at number of passengers on different transportation modes, but you could also look like look at the fuels that those modes are using to show if those modes are in themselves sustainable. So with that, I will pass it over to Ori and Jacob with group A2. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ori, and together with Jacob, we'll be presenting our work on the assessment, uh, assessment of resilience from the current sustainability plan. In this presentation, we'll be answering four key questions. First, what is resilience? What is, uh, why is resilience important for city development? How did we evaluate resilience? And um, what can the city learn from our evaluation? To ensure clarity, we structured our presentation into four sections, introduction, methodology, analysis, and limitation and gaps. Let's start by defining resilience. There are various resilience definitions. For instance, the city of Boston defines a real, uh, truly resilient city as one that strives for equity in all aspects, ensuring all residents have access to services provided by cities. Oakland defined resilience as an ability to withstand shocks and recover from it. In our analysis, we adopted a, a definition similar to Oakland's, but with an additional component of adaptation. Um, now, before I elaborate on the importance of resilience, I would like to draw your attention to these four pictures. Take a moment to reflect on whether you would be willing to move to a city with such challenges and think about why, the, uh, why do these phenomena happen? I believe most of you already have the answer of no for the first one and less resilient for the second one. Therefore, we can infer that, we can infer that resilience can bring several benefits to cities, including risk mitigation, economic stability, social equity, reputation, and so on. Now, Jacob. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodology that we used. Um, we found a resilience scorecard uh, created by a researcher named Woodruff. We used it to evaluate different plans, whether it be hazard mitigation plans or resilience plans, sustainability plans um, from cities participating in the 100 Resilient Cities Network. So we decided to take that scorecard and apply it to Peoria's sustainability plan in order to locate where uh, resilience was present in the plan and where it wasn't. And the uh, scorecard splits the metrics into seven different uh, resilience principles, um, going through them, fact-based, strategy identification, goals, uncertainty, coordination, implementation, and monitoring, and also public participation. You may be wondering why use a resilience scorecard. As I sort of mentioned, this scorecard that was developed has been used to evaluate plans um, on a whole host of cities participating in the 100 resilient cities. And um, language in plans is very important to how they're implemented and the effectiveness of their implementation. And that's why we sort of decided to use that. We are going to have our complete analysis with all of the different tables and scores in our report. This one's going to be more of a summary, but as an example of sort of what that looked like, this um, is the goals section of the scorecard. It lists a bunch of different criteria and more of a description of that criteria. 
we graded it, um, we coded it as either a one, it has it or uh, no, um, which actually that should be zero. My apologies, not a two, but um, I personally did it for my group. And then in group A3, Shaylin also coded the plan. Uh, we did it independently. So that way we could come together, compare our scores, increase reliability, and then um, discuss any scores that needed to be reconciled and go from there. Um, then for each principle, you know, we divided the number or the number of ones over the total number of criteria to sort of give a score um, to each principle, and then we can get an overall score of the plan. So I'm going to go through each of the seven principles and just sort of highlight a couple of examples of where resilience is present in each principle. Um, again, the full methodology and full um, analysis will be in our report. I just wanted to sort of condense it a little bit since we have some limited time. So the first principle is the goals principle. Um, one of the first things we notice right away is that um, in the we have our little indicators to show what pillars of the sustainability plan it's present in. Um, this first one actually was present in every pillar, but I just chose the transportation to highlight. Um, but so it's really nice that uh, y'all have goals defined with objectives to achieve them. Um, that sort of specific language is very, very helpful in making it easier to implement your uh, plan just when you have more concrete things that you're going to measure and you uh, lay that out there. Um, that's really helpful. Uh, another great thing that was present in every single pillar was the vision statements at the beginning. Again, this is very helpful for framing the um, scope of the plan and sort of what you hope to accomplish by implementing it. And so uh, we thought it was wonderful that you had that present for every single pillar. Next, oh, and I guess another thing to point out before I move on. So the score uh, at the top is sort of the um, score, the pot the total score that you guys got for each principle, um, which uh, it looks a little low, but um, compared to nationally, it's actually very good. So um, uh, then the next principle was coordination and coordination is really important just in ensuring that um, stakeholders were engaged in the creation of the plan and making sure that um, a lot of different entities were sort of able to shape the vision and the scope of the plan. And in this one, um, we really highlighted the municipal green team. Uh, we thought that was really fantastic in sort of specifically laying out which um, individuals were part of sort of the steering committee and really shaping the plan and bringing it to life. Um, it also kind of shows a lot of internal support in Peoria for making this plan happen. So that was really wonderful to see. Um, and since, yeah, it kind of guided the whole plan, that's why we assigned every um, pillar to it. Next was public participation, another one that y'all um, did very well on. Um, so the steering committee information was included, uh, pretty similar to the last um, principle, but this one uh, sort of double dips just because it also shows that there's a variety um, of individuals that your green team uh, was in contact with in sort of shaping the plan. Um, you also had information in the introduction of the plan that was about public participation, um, shouting out different public meetings that you had and different stakeholders that you engaged. And that's really awesome that um, you're also incorporating uh, public and stakeholder feedback into your plan um, as it makes it more collaborative and ultimately will sort of improve the uh, cohesion and implementation of the plan moving forward. Next, we have fact base. Um, and so in this one, it was uh, a couple of things that we noted were the inclusion of multiple levels of data in informing your report. Um, so there was one section where you were using information, not only from your survey that you conducted yourself, but also from the American Community Survey, which is a really great data set that's collected. Um, I'm also putting up there the uh, the picture of the preserving wildlife corridors, just because you had mentioned in your report that you consulted the Sonoran Preservation Program, which is another regional plan that is really great that you are sort of aligning with. Um, and so having multiple levels of data informing your report was really wonderful. The next sort of takeaway we took from this pillar or principle was the um, prior prioritization schema for risks and vulnerabilities. Uh, you are sure, you make sure in each pillar to sort of identify whether your objectives and goals are low priority, medium priority, high priority, and also how much of an impact they have. And that again, gives a lot of information on how to uh, prioritize implementation of your plan if you can't necessarily do everything all at once. Having the ability to um, prioritize implementation is wonderful. 
The next principle was strategy identification. Ooh, sorry. Um, you, I was highlighting a couple of your pillars here because you have a very wide diversity of strategies, which is really great. Looking at all the different pillars, it kind of makes sense that you would because they're all a very diverse array of pillars, but you have um, more social actions that you hope to take in terms of education. You have more um, environmental, more traditionally biological interventions with sort of the Xeriscape Zeris, um, rebates and the sort of uh, evaluation of those that you were hoping on doing. And then you also have more technological approaches with the cool pavement options. And that's uh, present all throughout your plan. And that's really great that it's not um, just one sort of strategy, but you're really utilizing a wide array of them. Similarly for this one, you again have a really great prioritization schema that we're highlighting. Um, again, with pointing out the um, priority and also the timeline of your timeline of your different implementation um, abilities. We also thought it was really cool that you had the stars to sort of represent what the public really wanted. Um, that's again, another way to sort of show the public that you're listening to them and you're taking into consideration what they want. And also that you're sort of committing to working on uh, the uh, things that they wanted to. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Next, we had implementation and monitoring. Uh, so for this one, the first thing that we noticed was that you had a framework for future updates and accountability, which is really important um, in making sure that you are following through with the plan and regularly keeping the public and other stakeholders sort of updated on how progress is coming along and whatever difficulties or um, uh, triumphs that you're encountering. So that was really great. And um, it's also a very specific plan. You know, you mentioned every three years you were gonna make an update, which is really cool to have that sort of specific timestamp on it. Um, again, going back to the green team, that was actually a really fantastic implementation um, or a fantastic uh, part of your plan that we really enjoyed. Um, but you also sort of had key performance indicators that every individual on the green team was responsible for. So again, that specific assigning is really helpful, really awesome. Um, increases accountability, makes sure that people know, oh, I, you know, I'm really interested in what the municipal electricity use is like. It kind of lays out who they can get in contact with and who they can follow up with to make sure that um, that's being addressed. And then sort of the last principle was uh, uncertainty. And this one you sort of addressed by talking about multiple timelines for interventions, which is really important, sort of acknowledging that some things can be achieved quickly, some things might take a little bit more time, um, sort of having that multiple uh, time scale mindset and making sure that you are um, sort of thinking not only in the short term, but also long term, um, because yeah, the impacts from climate change and stuff will be long lasting. Um, so just again, a look at the overall grades for each of the principles. There are some that you did really great in, some maybe not as great. One thing to point out, your overall plan score was 44%, and the 100 Resilient Cities plan, when they were all being evaluated with a scorecard, the average score for a plan was 47%. So really, you're pretty in line with um, other cities around the United States and sort of where resilience is present in their plans, um, which is really cool. And then just to sort of mention a couple of gaps, which then A3 will further elaborate on. Um, so there was some terminology that potentially was missing from the plan. Uh, I know this is a sustainability plan, but things um, like adaptive capacity, adaptability, uh, resilience, those sorts of terminology were maybe missing. Um, climate change, we noticed that there uh, wasn't too many mentions of climate change in your plan. Um, multiple scenario planning, just sort of trying to address multiple potential future scenarios that may um, arise, ensuring equity and participation was another thing that we noticed. And then finally, um, just funding sources was sort of one of the bigger ones, just um, where funding would be coming from, potentially what things might have to happen um, to be able to fund some of these strategies. Uh, that was just one other thing we, that we noticed. And now we're gonna turn it over to Shaylin with group A3 to talk about how to address some of these gaps. All right, hi everybody. My name is Shaylin and I'm going to be presenting, oops, um, for A3 today and our 
um, group was tasked with trying to understand how the city of Peoria could build resilience um, off of their sustainability plan. So how could that be enhanced um, throughout the city? And we do this um, using the methodology that Jacob um, outlined in um, Group A2's presentation. So we do a plan quality analysis. Um, I just want to highlight a few more things about the plan quality analysis is that um, it has over 160 criteria that um, we sort of were analyzing throughout sustainability, um, the city of Peoria sustainability plan for resilience and adaptation. And again, those were scored um, on a zero or one basis, um, whether or not the plan included it or not. And then additionally, there's um, seven principles, which Jacob outlined really nicely. One component that our group added um, was this group score. So we added the group score to reflect um, the impact of the proposed um, resilience strategies that we will pre present to you guys. Um, and they highlight multiple dimensions of resilience potentially that the city could use. Um, for this presentation, we're only be, we will only be presenting on um, the highest group scores just because of time, but in our, our project, um, right up we will have like all of the um, strategies that we recommended so these this is kind of like an outline of our slides so we go through each um, principle from one through seven and then we have the correlating percentage that the city of peoria um, had in the sustainability plan and so our first one is um, goals here we highlight um, two definitional terms um, that could really help the city of Peoria um, build resilience. Um, the first one is having a exact definition of um, adaptation, adaptation goals and a vision. So the IPCC um, has a very like simplistic definition of adaptation, which is the process of adjustment to actual expected climate change and its effects. And then the link is on here and we'll include that in um, the project write up as well. So we scored this a four out of five. Um, adaptation is a very key component of resilience and being able to sort of not only bounce back from change, but adapt from climate change and its impacts. And then obviously the definition of resilience, which we have developed along with group A2. Um, I think a concrete definition of resilience will really help the city to um, think through what strategies and policies they sort of want to uh, focus on. And hopefully this will help as well. Um, but that these two definitional terms, I think, can serve as like a touch point to look back on to ensure um, that whatever strategies are being recommended are um, based on these sort of definitional terms. So the second principle is coordination. And in this principle, the things that we are going to highlight are public and private coordination, nonprofits and um, agencies. So um, one thing that we wanted to note is the business engagement to address vulnerabilities and resources. Um, so we have an example from Miami Beach's um, resilient plan where the city of Miami engaged schools, hospitals, and businesses to provide expertise on resilience um, to sea level rise particularly, which isn't an issue for Peoria, but I think the engagement section um, is really important here in ensuring that not only do you have like buy-in from stakeholders, but also businesses uh, to not only enhance like resilience against some particular hazard, but economic resilience as well. Um, so we're highlighting that here, which has a high group score, obviously that's what we're presenting on, but just um, we think that this has the potential to address like multiple facets of resilience. So focusing on it here. And then the second one is we wanted to um, recommend engaging nonprofits as well. Um, so similarly with businesses uh, partnering with no local nonprofits for planning and input um, about like resources um, to potentially like work with charities to identify community needs and encourage resilience planning, um, equality and inclusion. So I think an important thing with nonprofits is um, engaging community-based organizations per the APA's recommendation um, to increase equity and ensure that all voices are being heard in the planning process. We know that the city of Peoria um, did do like a public participation um, sort of aspect. And obviously that was um, highlighted in group A2's uh, presentation. 
But I think being very more specific on sort of like what that public participation ensured and if like nonprofits were engaged, including that um, and highlighting that as well, because it's a key component in increasing equity. And then next, building on to public participation. So different ways that um, the public and community could be involved in the planning process. As I mentioned, you guys did have um, like public input on the city um, sustainability plan, but, um, and you have the outlined like stakeholders that were involved, but what each stakeholder kind of like represents and how they sort of were um, involved in the sustainability plan was a little bit unclear. So what we recommended was involving um, stakeholders and being more explicit about what their roles are and how they sort of um, helped with the plans. And then also um, we recommended that the city of Peoria should potentially include like low income or non-English speaking groups in planning and implementation, um, again, to increase equity and um, ensure that uh, the like overall plan um, and future planning for resilience is inclusive to all community members. And then principle four, which is fact-based. Um, one thing that group two did highlight is this is a section that was um, a little bit lower scoring than some other sections. So we have a few different recommendations here. Um, the first one is using different international studies, which Jacob highlighted as well. Um, so different like climate change scenario planning. Um, the city of Phoenix uses studies from um, the C40 initiative, which is a, a group that specifically helps um, cities on resilience. So a rec we have in our project overview um, or our project write up as a recommendation for the city of Peoria to potentially look into C40 um, because they give a lot of guiding principles on how to plan for resilience. Also, the IPCC has um, different climate change scenarios that could better inform like resilience planning in the future. Um, so those are our recommendations here. We do note that the city of Peoria has completed an emissions assessment, but it doesn't um, currently include like the climatic drivers or like previous um, greenhouse gas emission assessments or potential future ones. So that's a key component of resilience. And then additionally, um, building on that is using historic climate data. So discussing how long-term weather or a long, how long-term climate change um, has affected the area or has changed um, recently or in the past and sort of how to address that in the future and utilizing that data to inform um, decisions um, around resilience. And we also noted that um, Infrastructure wasn't really identified as being impacted by changing climate conditions. Um, obviously, infrastructure is a key role in resilience and ensuring that the infrastructure that is new or old can withstand or adapt to changes in the climate. Um, so I think it would be helpful to understand ways that the city can build resilience into their infrastructure. We do highlight here that um, the sustainability plan does address like sustainable water uses, but more detail could be included about like the redundancy in their water infrastructure and um, to help ensure that water supply is secure in a changing climate, just as an example. And then additionally on fact base, um, we noted that a vulnerability assessment would be um, important to increase resilience in the city. So we give a few examples of um, where a vulnerability assessment could be attained or the data. So um, the Maricopa County Multi-Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan actually has vulnerability assessments for um, all jurisdictions within the city. So that could be used to help inform resilience um, strategies in the city. Also, the CDC Social Vulnerability Index has around 16 variables that identify the most at-risk communities um, within a city that could also be utilized and is like publicly accessible data. Um, the reason we recommend this is to help prioritize areas that may be um, more impacted by climate change or potentially less resilient to build resilience within those areas overall. And then principle five is strategy identification. So these are just a list of sort of um, strategies. And then one thing that we noted is 
co-benefits um, weren't really mentioned, but you guys do have quite a few strategies that could have overlapping benefits within the city um, within the city's sustainability plan. So one thing we've mentioned is um, the plan talks about this tree and shade master plan um, and mostly just on like tree canopy coverage. But I think it would like it could be highlighted that there are other benefits from like a tree and shade master plan and increasing canopy coverage. Um, like creating open space for community members and um, improving air quality, reducing heat stress, um, et cetera, which could build resilience um, in the community. And then our sixth principle, implementation and moderate monitoring. Um, so here, um, which Jacob touched on as well, is really identifying the barriers and potential obstacles that could prevent strategies from being implemented or coming to fruition um, or being completed. So some of the potential barriers to implementation could be funding or lack of public awareness. Um, additionally, not just on um, more on the infrastructure side or like an outdated electric grid or um, outdated water infrastructure as I was talking about previously. So really understanding like where those barriers potentially are and increasing resilience um, there for a changing climate. And then the strategies to overcome those barriers again are like maybe pursuing alternative funding um, through different areas, understanding like community input um, to like implement that funding in a way that is not only building resilience, but also is um, helpful to the community at large and then updating key infrastructure. And then our principle seven uncertainty, which also has a lower um, score overall with 8%. Um, uncertainty is a really key part of resilience and sort of understanding how to adapt to climate change, where those barriers may be, and like how to address the uncertainty of it all. Um, with the climate scenarios that we sort of uh, recommended from the IPCC, there are a lot of uncertainty in there. So how to sort of deal with that when creating um, implementation strategies. There are a number of ways this can be done. And one key concept we wanna highlight here is adaptation. Um, so the ability to adapt, I think is an important piece here. And then essentially what can we do with the information we um, obtain from monitoring? So you guys have like implementation and monitoring strategies like set up. So once you have gathered that information, sort of how you can utilize that to increase resilience overall in the city. So the first example is through um, scenario planning. And I apologize if uh, I'm not as great as explaining this as uh, Thomas maybe would have been, but I'm gonna give it my best. <laughs> um, so with scenario planning, um, with the graphic that is on the screen, this highlights plausible futures that are identified and a plan is determined that fits um, those scenarios. And scenarios um, are the means to achieve whatever goal. So there's sort of this graphic that like walks you through what those steps would look like, but taking this a, st um, a step further, we recommend potentially using assumption-based planning. So that assumes there's a plan already in motion, which you guys do have the sustainability plan and examines the underlying assumptions to protect it from failing. And this is used to make um, existing scenarios more robust. So increasing robustness ensures that um, the plan is more likely to succeed. And then we're potentially, we're specifically looking at to identify when to adapt the plan in these scenarios and what possible ways that could be done. And then this is a little graphic on assumption-based planning. So you have the plans, the assumptions, and then potential plausible events, um, load-bearing or vulnerable assumptions, broken assumptions, and then you have your certain outcomes. And then additionally, we have adaptive pathways. So all prospective pathways lead to the same goal, and there is more than one way to achieve the desired goal. Um, so identifying tipping points and leveraging this method uh, for potential cost reductions. Um, so again, I think just ensuring um, in terms of resilience that when you're using sort of adaptive pathways or adaptive strategies for resilience, um, making sure I, one thing that um, we don't have on here, but will be included in the write-up is um, like fail to save for win-win strategies. So even if the strategy was um, potentially to fail, that there wouldn't be some, you know, um, like a complete failure of a particular system or like a citywide failure. Um, so that is our 
overall uh, presentation and we'll include more detail in the project write up. I do want to mention um, one limitation here is we are just looking at one singular plan and obviously cities have multiple plans. Um, so there could be things that are being done to increase resilience that might not be highlighted here. Um, but yeah, thank you. And we're gonna pass it on to building codes. I'm going to go slide with you. Oh. Oh. So uh, our goal is to uh, introduce you to some of the changes that have happened within building codes uh, over the past, you know, three years as they've, con as they've converted to the 2021 editions, as well as introduce you to green construction codes in a general sense. Um, because there's so much material here, we provide you with handouts, which contains, you know, the bulk of the changes and important codes going on. Um, we're going to hit some key highlights, and then we're going to move on to some key takeaways and then recommendations for how implementing this data. All right, so to start off, um, the three codes that we looked at are the International Residential Code, which is simply the baseline code for the predominant land use in Peoria. Um, we felt that this was a good you know, indicator of what a baseline level of, uh, of sustainability looks like. Um, we also looked at the International Energy Conservation Code, which you guys have already adopted. That applies to residential and commercial properties. Um, and it's also pretty widely adopted. And the International Green Construction Code, which is much less widely adopted. It's only been adopted in eight cities so far. Um, and which has a very broad range of sustainability impacts throughout you know, the entire process of development and the entire subject. Um, the thing about the International Green Construction Code is that it's predominantly focused on commercial building and mid-rise residential. And the only mid-rise residential development currently in Peoria is Paradiso at P83. So if you guys would like to focus on less higher, less mid-rise developments and more of the single family development that you guys have currently, what you can do is use uh, the International Green Construction Code to mandate section M101, which mandates ICC 700, which is the low rise, uh, which is the low rise developments um, green construction code. Um, this is a very flexible development code. It's pretty easy to comply with, and it's uh, and this has been used in at least one other city that we were able to identify. So, and the sustainability impacts our approach, uh, our approach here. So. Sorry, uh, our approach in this section involves uh, focusing on the codes from the IRC, IECC, and IGCC with regards to the sustainability impacts in the areas of uh, water, energy, and uh, heat and air quality. Uh, so this is an overview of the, uh, of the codes worth no noticing. And also, for example, in the IRC plumbing code, uh, it addresses determining the, can you please go back, uh, determining the system design flow, which is can uh, promote a more uh, water use uh, uh, con uh, cons water conservation uh, measures and efficiency, and also it states uh, the use of specific standards and requirements for materials in the uh, water system that can be used. And, and also by adopting the 2021 uh, international code, it can touch on major uh, 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 key areas. So first, uh, the water conservation by providing like uh, water saving fixtures such as low floor uh, toilets or faucets can contribute to um, uh, promote more water efficiency measures. Uh, within the residential section, and also the use of the reclaimed water and alternative uh, sources for potable and non-potable uses as well, uh, such as uh, irrigation. And the use of, uh, and the implementation of green infrastructure and low impact development specifically for new development. And this will also uh, satisfy the goal of uh, uh, stormwater and flood management as well. Uh, and I also forgot to mention in the second point, it also pertains to the water services fifth objective and the smart growth sixth one 
uh, six objective, which uh, expands on the alternative use of potable and non-potable sources and the extension of reclaimed water services. And this is uh, an overview of the, uh, uh, of the compatibility of the codes within uh, the general plan and sustainability. It's uh, not specifically for each one, but we found that uh, it's overlapping within all of these, which kind of promote a more uh, uh, a water and uh, water system uh, more efficiently within the city of Peoria as well. So next, I'm going to briefly touch on updates in the codes for energy efficiency. So these are the codes that uh, you can reference in the handout, and there's many more. Um, there's a lot of overlap between these codes. So of course, in green construction codes, it will, it will touch on energy, same with residential codes. Um, and I will touch on that further on the next slide. So uh, there's overlap between the codes and also overlap between the goals and policies that they will meet. In the sustainability plan, Peoria addresses that 51% of electricity usage is from buildings and facilities. In a previous sustainability plan that y'all published, um, you had a goal to reduce your uh, emissions by 33% from 2000 to 2020. So if you're looking to continue to reduce your emissions, a large chunk of that could come through your electricity usage. And the main part of that is buildings. So one way you could do this is a lot of codes about insulation. They're covered throughout the IRC, the IGCC, and the IECC. So throughout all those codes, there's several insulation uh, updates, but one of which pertains to fenestration or windows. So one way you can do this is through the U factor with a maximum uh, recommended U factor of 0.35. Um, and that will address promoting efficient use of energy, working towards reducing the overall energy footprint and um, a lot of other uh, plans and sustainability plans, goals and policies. Construction code. One of the most significant points is heats, uh, at least for Peoria and for Arizona in general, is the urban heat island effect. Um, again, we have a couple of codes here that you can look at in the, in the books that we handed out if you would like. Um, but I'd like to specifically highlight in the IGC 501.3.5. Now, what this does requires a certain portion of hardscape, that's asphalt, turf, pass, and the like, to be either shaded by native vegetation or color, lightly colored or use permeable, uh, you know, permeable ground. As well as if you so choose, this is a jurisdictional option for buildings and retaining walls and structural walls and the like to be shaded. Um, so a lot, this is pretty standard already in Peoria and in the state in general. And um, it's a good, a big part of your guys' goals, but I think it's an important aspect to look at from a building code perspective because there isn't a lot of value to like a boulevard with trees, for instance, next to a parking lot. Um, yeah, so the IGCC is a pretty well-rounded and holistic code. So it has a lot of other points. And one that I would particularly like to highlight is the materials provisions. Uh, the material provisions require developers to use one of two of the following, which is 10% recycled material, 10% uh, locally produced material, 5% bio-based material, or 10 building products with you know, certifications. Alternatively, they can do a life cycle analysis. This is a good example of you know, A, how the IGCC can help you achieve your you know, solid waste production plans and you know, sustainability requirements, but also how it allows for flexibility in the development process and uh, sets manageable and achievable goals. So addressing that, before we jump to, uh, sorry. So before we jump into the key uh, takeaways in this section, we wanted to address first some of the major theme updates. Can go to the next slide? Of the, between the 2018 and then 21 uh, code which addresses the water conservation, reclaimed water and the green uh, infrastructure and LI, uh, low impact uh, developments. And that will hopefully uh, achieve, you know, for a, a better building standards for the city of uh, Peoria within water uh, conservation and uh, systems. So for the IECC, uh, there were several uh, themes and updates between 2018 and 2021. These themes include increased energy efficiency, solar ready requirements, lighting controls, mechanical system efficiency, and commissioning. And there's several reasons for which you could, you should consider uh, implementing some of these updates. 
So one a report we found commissioned by the EPA um, conducted by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory um, was on these updates themselves. So you can see in these two tables, the first of which is a multitude of uh, factors that they measured for the uh, provisions in the 2018 codes and the second tables for 2021. So one point that I will highlight um, when comparing the climate zone of 2B, which is majority of Peoria's is 2B, um, is that you reduce your CO2 emissions by one ton per residence per year just by updating uh, the codes to the, to the most recent. So this report also was uh, very effective in communicating which codes they felt would create the most return on investment. So they produced these 11, which pertain to lighting, insulation, ventilation, and additional efficiency packages. Um, so there's a lot of different categories that you could dive into here um, and a lot of really solid ways to improve. Uh, overall, there was a 10% um, improvement and about 10% for a lot of different factors. Um, uh, one that is of great importance is annual energy cost and percent of carbon emissions. So I think the best way to think about the IGCC is as a set of upgrades from the International Electric Energy Conservation. Now, the primary fields that these are in are in increased energy efficiency. We're looking at 5 to 10% increases over the IECC in most categories, including systems, HVAC systems, and the like, um, where the IECC, for instance, requires you know, the provisions for on-site renewable. The IGCC requires their installation. Uh, the IGCC requires slightly upgraded you know, standards for control systems, and the IECC does, um, and where the IECC requires commissioning after the end of the developing process, the IGCC requires, commi requires commissioning through the first year of occupancy. Um, and the IGCC is, of course, again, a holistic code that sort of goes all through the process and continues on into the plans for building occupation, um, and is also sort of on the forefront of sustainable practices like green roof designs, sustainable irrigation, and of course, low impact development. Um, so it's very difficult to find studies for the actual specific implementation of the International Green Construction Code. We found one, which was focused on uh, four US Air Force buildings. Um, these buildings were already slated to be uh, lead silver, and the upgrades that were required to bring it to the IBCC uh, totaled the numbers that you can see there. They're pretty modest, except for one, which involved the rich re the retrofit of a runway, which was being used as a parking lot, into a white pavement, which was quite expensive. Um, likewise, if you guys seek to implement the ICC 700 requirements, uh, you know, provided in the IGCC, um, you can expect to see 40 to 50 percent residential energy savings. Um, that said, we do have a pretty good, solid body of evidence for the implement the impacts of green construction in general, and the consensus of those uh, requirements is that they are generally speaking, cheap to implement and have long-term benefits for cost. Yep. Um, one thing that I would particularly like to uh, refer you to that Greg Katz book, which is definitely the gold standard for study for research in this area. So there are so many case studies for all of these code updates because there's so many code updates. Um, but there's a couple that I wanted to touch on today, the first of which being co-benefits of energy efficiency and residential buildings, um, as we tried to do focus on residential for you guys. And this study was a quantitative analysis of three different levels of energy efficiency, where they took several different updates to improve energy efficiency into account. Um, and an increase in energy efficiency, we saw, or they they saw an increase um, in hours comfortable for window use, reduced risk of airborne diseases when indoors. Um, it reduces indoor and outdoor heat exposure. Um, it also led to a substantial difference in HVAC energy demand and peak load and a decrease in greenhouse gas and AP emissions, um, as well as a decrease in air temperature inside the open canopy. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which increasing energy efficiency will meet a lot of Peoria's goals, but um, they did see that there's a difference in payoff, of course. 
So for the level two of energy efficiency, there was a payoff of seven years compared to the level three that was much more intense. There was a 28 year payoff. So depending on who you're trying to motivate to incorporate these updates, um, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, but of course, with any level, there were these improvements nonetheless, just at differing ranges. I wanna briefly touch on case study number two. Um, I forgot to mention earlier that there's a lot of different ways that you can utilize um, building to reduce energy consumption and needs. Um, one of which is green roof design, but there's also um, solar reflectance and thermal emittance. Um, so when trying to decide what to prioritize in updating those codes, uh, I came across this study done in Panoma uh, University where they saw that the community was um, very interested in the aesthetic and environmental advantages of green roof design. However, there's concerns for cost and construction from professionals. And so as we are prioritizing what codes to be updating as the future progresses, um, I'm sure there will be many more studies for each code that you could dive into. Um, so some of them might be uh, even though the community response might be for it, less likely to have the payoff that you would want. So real quick, we're gonna go into some of our recommendations. Uh, for one thing, you have quite a few options for how to implement the international infrastructure. I think we think of the most effective one is certainly the mandatory path, but a couple of cities had the option of going with incentives, which give you know cost or exp expedited approval uh, awards to things that uh, are, are approved of the IPCC. Um, one option is also allowing zoning variances to require that, which would be pretty in line with Peoria's process, given that they have a lot of zoning variances. Um, we found that the voluntary path was unlikely to produce very many benefits, and most cities who followed the voluntary path didn't even weren't even aware that they had done so previously. Uh, that was supposed to say don't follow Scott Skill's example, um, so Scottsdale has removed a large chunks of the, I, of the IGCC, predominantly because they have a pretty robust um, provisional codes, like above, their, uh, above the international codes that allow them to remove those things without a significant amount of impact. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> uh, so our recommendations are update your existing codes of the 2021 version. Uh, and adopt the International Green Construction Codes, mandating the ICC 700 to allow for residential energy efficiency. Um, and once you do that, you need to create a robust mechanism for actually enforcing that code after that one year period, because it's difficult to remove, to, to, re to you know, retract certificates of occupancy for buildings due to their lack of provision. Um, in the meantime, we think that it's important for you guys to investigate solar energy provisions and the ICC 700, which were two plans that we didn't really have enough time to go into in detail, um, and continue this process for the ICC 20, for the uh, International Codes 2024 editions, which uh, are currently in development and under undergoing drafts right now. And uh, it's very important for you guys to collect data on implementing these things and make sure that it's readily available for um, the city and for, you know, other people who might be able to use this data to better fulfill and understand how this is affecting your sustainability goals. Uh, 